celebrating 41 seasons on the year. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, as trade tensions heat up even more, the Senate version of the Farm Bill makes it out of committee, while a revote on the House version may have hit a snag. They're still asking the question, what is meat? Investors are sensing new markets, setting off a turf war between two government agencies. They're called butterfly bushes, but they attract a lot more than butterflies. And the pecan industry is cracking new markets. Farm Week starts right now. Leighton Span. And I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. As American leaders wrestle with the farm bill, trade tensions continuing to build as the president announced that $50 billion in Chinese goods will face a 25% tariff and then upped the ante to $200 billion. China, meanwhile, wasted no time in announcing it was ready to retaliate. The tensions are motivating farmers to look ahead at potential losses, especially soybeans. Ohio State University is predicting Ohio farmers would lose 59 percent of their income if a tariff was imposed. Meanwhile, a nonprofit trade group is buying airtime to put pressure on the administration to end the skirmish before it gets out of hand. Mark Boyer and his family have run Ridgetop Orchards for nearly 40 years. We sell apples all around the country and export all around the globe. The U.S. apple industry does depend on exports. But trade policy from Washington puts orchards like Mark's at risk. Without certainty in foreign markets, why would you invest in equipment? Why would you invest in anything? The stakes are high. People will lose their jobs. President Trump, the ag community supported you. End the trade war and support free trade. In the meantime, pressure mounting to get a farm bill done. The Senate passed its version out of committee. Apparently, negotiations there were less confrontational. Seeing a quorum, I call this meeting of the committee to order. The Senate Agriculture Committee spent part of the week marking up their version of the 2018 Farm Bill. Members waited through 12 titles and 66 amendments for the industry that provides 16 million jobs in this country. The absolute requirement for this committee is to provide farmers, ranchers, growers, and everyone within the agriculture and food value chain certainty and predictability. Robert says he heard producers tell him crop insurance was priority one in new legislation. Individual senators spoke about important topics in their home states and how the Farm Bill will improve life in rural America through improvements in the conservation, food, and nutrition titles. Rural communities across Vermont and every corner of America, representing every single state here, will directly benefit from this bill. Thank you Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, McConnell here serves here. on the committee and touted the benefits of expanding assistance for hemp. Younger farmers in my state are particularly interested in going in this uh, direction. All the people in, in rural Kentucky who sort of grew up with tobacco are hoping that this will be really something. The Senate committee has worked in a bipartisan manner on the measure. Good sense. farm policy benefits every single American every single day because we have the highest quality, lowest cost food supply in the world. On this vote, the yeas are 198, the nays are 213. The bill does not pass. The House failed to pass their version of the Farm Bill as no Democrat, and even some Republicans cited concerns over immigration and food assistance aspects of the bill. Nutrition assistance has been less thorny in the Senate's version, but there was still some tension among committee members. We must do more to help SNAP recipients rise up out of poverty. The U.S. economy is booming right now. For the first time on record, the number of job openings exceeds the number of Americans looking for work. Senator Grassley. Senator Charles Senator Grassley Senator cast the lone dissenting vote. The Iowa Republican wants stronger language, putting a cap on the amount of money farmers can get from the farm program. 
Grassley is unsure how he'll vote in the full Senate version, but has a strong recollection of the last go-round when his amendment advanced both chambers, but didn't make it through conference committee. The eyes are 20 and the nose are one. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. A few weeks ago, we asked the question, what is me? Well now, with investors looming on the sidelines, two different government agencies say they're responsible for the answer while they jockey for a position to govern the process. The FDA says that it has jurisdiction over meat grown in labs, so-called clean meat, and has scheduled a public meeting on July 12th to discuss, quote, the production of foods using animal cell culture technology. At the same time, the USDA claims jurisdiction over the trendy product saying that under federal law, meat and poultry inspections are under its scrutiny. The new industry has attracted major investors, including Bill Gates. Clean meat advocates say they don't want the USDA to be in charge, worried that the livestock industry will have too much influence. With all of the fun of summer and weekend barbecues, it's easy to forget just how quickly the calories add up. But in this Encore Food Factor, a mid-year reminder of how keeping a food diary might just be the motivation you need. And now, it's time for Daily Food Journaling with Natasha. Dear Diary, Keeping up with what I eat every day is a challenge. If I don't write it down right away, I usually forget. So I think I'm gonna try one of those food journal apps on my phone. Wow, that was easier than I thought. Dear Diary, apparently I'm gonna have to go get my vision checked. I've been eyeballing my portion sizes for years, but when I switched over to actually measuring my food, huh, I found out what I thought was a half a cup of pasta was a whole lot of pasta. Dear Diary, I've always heard that losing weight is all about the math, but I didn't really believe it until I saw all the calories stacking up from snacking. I'm figuring out that fruits and vegetables can fill me up without adding a whole lot of calories. Dear Diary, major breakthrough this week. I have learned that I feel better when I don't eat a lot of fried foods. My stomach doesn't hurt, and I have way more energy throughout the day. Can you believe it? It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Most gardeners like to attract pollinators. And in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Gary Bachman shows us that butterfly bushes attract a lot more than just butterflies. It seems like every homeowner wants plants for bee-friendly gardens, but don't despair about the name of today's plant. Besides butterflies, it also attracts pollinators and hummingbirds. Today, Southern Gardening is visiting the LSU Ag Center Hammond Research Station with their great butterfly bush collection. Known botanically as Budlia, the flowers are sweetly fragrant panicles of tiny blooms in various shades of white, blue, purple, pink, red, and even yellow. The flowers are displayed on arching, graceful stems. Butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds love these flowers. I like this collection because it features small stature selections. Here are a few. Flutterby Petite Tutti Fruity Pink displays seven to eight inch panicles of fuchsia red flowers, each having a lighter center. This is great to enjoy grown in a sunny landscape. Little Angel has a dense and compact habit. Long, pure white panicles, up to 10 inches, appear during the early spring and summer. Reblooming occurs later in the year, extending the flowering season. And Little Nugget has a wide, low habit featuring masses of long wands of magenta purple flowers displayed over stunning golden foliage. This is truly a garden treasure to behold. Plant butterfly bush in the full sun for best flowering as shade will reduce flowering and the plant will become thin and leggy. Butterfly bush is tolerant of any soil type as long as it's well drained. 
Butterfly bush has a loose growing habit that should never be contained by pruning. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. It is hard to beat the butterfly bush, but as Gary just said, make sure they get full sun even in warm climates. He says they need a good six hours of sunshine a day at least. Mm. Time now for the markets with Leighton. Well, Mike, there is plenty of heat, talking about sunshine, in the commodity markets these days. Favorable crop ratings and new tariff threats push soybean futures down under $9 a bushel. U.S. pork suffers in its top foreign market. And cheap imports continue to undercut a key Gulf Coast aquaculture industry. This week didn't start with a bang. It started with a break, a break in grain prices. At one point Tuesday, soybeans were down 22 to 25 cents a bushel, while corn was down 7 to 8. Improving crop conditions and a worsening trade tiff between the U.S. and China are being given the credit. Now, some traders said the last time November bean futures slipped to 8.99 was back in August 2016. Meanwhile, in the midst of all this came new supply-demand figures that are described as actually positive for the grains as well as cotton. The government trimmed old and new crop ending stocks across the board, as Extension's Josh Maples explains. What's the most significant thing to you in this USDA report? So the June WASDE report was actually pretty favorable for corn, soybeans, and cotton in terms of reduced ending stocks. So soybean ending stocks were down about 30 million bushels over the May report. Uh, corn ending stocks down about 105 million bushels over the May report for U.S. stocks. And then the big news in cotton was about a half million bale increase or revision in 2017-2018 exports. So this brought down the, the stock level in cotton as well. So overall pretty favorable in terms of, of stock levels, ending stock levels across all three commodities. At this point, do you think the grain markets in particular have a chance to regain some of the ground that, that they've apparently lost here price-wise? Yeah, it's a good question. So even despite a relatively favorable WASD, uh, we've seen significant declines in corn and soybean prices. So you look at the December corn futures have shed more than 40 cents since late May. So the last three weeks have been rough for corn prices. November soybean futures have shed over a dollar during the same time period. Uh, of course, it's it's the outside factors that have traders concerned. You know, the, the 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 trade talks, ongoing trade talks, ongoing trade environment, it's bringing a lot of uncertainty into the market. And this this is the question that really has to be answered. Or at least traders need to be a little more have to have a little more confidence um, before we're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of regaining in those price declines. Well, you mentioned soybeans there. Do you think that market in particular is maybe? artificially low now? Has it kind of gone into panic mode and gone too far south? Sure, that's a great question. And there's certainly some indications that the market is oversold. Uh, but again, it's that uncertainty piece. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, is it artificially low? Well, that's, you add uncertainty into a market and you start looking at a wider range, right? And you start right. talking about more than just, okay, is the level correct? You have to talk about that band around the level. Time now for today's trivia quiz on Farm Week. Our question involves a little pesticide history. Here it is. What year did the EPA order a ban on the domestic use of the pesticide DDT? Is the answer 1954, 1961, 1972, or 1989? We'll have that answer coming up for you. We'll take a short break, but coming up on our Farm Week feature, we've got a nutty story for you. The pecan industry is cracking new markets. Thanks to international interest, prices have exploded. In fact, prices are so good, some farmers are clearing out other crops to make way for the precious pecan. Whether you say it pecan or pecan or some other way, one thing's for sure, there's a payday going on right now. That's coming up on Farm Week. We'll be right back. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Never carry more than one person on a single rider four-wheeler. The four-wheeler can become unstable and very dangerous. ATVs are designed for off-road use only. Never drive one on a highway or any other paved surface. And always ride the right size machine at the right speed. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. 
Before we get to the market report, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First, it's the 2018 4-H Cow Camp in Starkville, Mississippi. This is for all 4-Hers thinking about showing cattle. You'll learn about grooming and fitting, proper nutrition for cows and calves, and about detecting and preventing common diseases. Registration is $100 per attendee and includes a lunch and two dinners. The fee must be received by Saturday, June 30th. For information, call Dr. Amanda Stone at 662-769-9941. Next, July 19th through the 21st, the 20th Annual Southern Peanut Growers Conference at the Sandestin Resort at Miramar Beach, Florida. This conference is for peanut growers in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, and Mississippi. This year's theme is Opportunities in Change, focusing on growth in the industry overall. Registration is $145, which includes all conference events and meals. For more information, including activities and conference sessions, visit southernpeanutfarmers.org. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. The U.S. Meat Export Federation says the U.S. pork industry will likely be losing hundreds of millions of dollars if Mexico continues with the duties it has placed on U.S. pork products entering the country. Implemented this month is a 20% tariff on chilled or frozen U.S. pork, a 15% tariff on pork-only sausages, and a 20% tariff on cooked American ham. The Meat Export Federation says the likely result will be a lower volume of U.S. pork exports and lower U.S. retail pork prices due to the domestic market having to absorb all the excess product. Farm-raised catfish is not the only aquaculture industry in the South losing market share to cheaper imported species. So is the shrimp business. The 2018 shrimping season is underway along the Gulf Coast, and once again, imports from China, India, and Indonesia are competing against the American product. In neighboring Louisiana, U.S. Senator John Kennedy is calling for an inspection fee to be levied on the imports. The, the foreign shrimp that's coming in to America is not being inspected, and some of it is dangerous, and, and it's unsafe, aside from the fact that it's, it's unfairly putting my people out of business. The senator told the members of the Louisiana Shrimp Association that other countries are simply cheating and that he's ready to put a stop to it. He admits it will be a tough fight. We've got a lot of countries that, that subsidize their seafood industry illegally, the government gives them subsidies, and they're able to dump that product. It's an inferior product, but I'll come back to that. They dump that product on the world market. That's not a level playing field, folks. Senator Kennedy says other possible ways to stem the flow of imported shrimp include the implementation of a tariff or placing quotas on that shrimp. Well, looking back now to trivia, we wrap things up here in the markets, and today's question again, it was about that pesticide DDT. What year did the EPA order a ban on the domestic use of DDT? The answer is C, 1972. Right now, with trade wars and tariffs and threats of market retaliation, we spend most of our time talking about corn and soybeans and pork. But there's actually one segment of the market doing pretty well, and that's the pecan industry. Prices are up, and even brand new farmers are getting into the business. Here's Colleen Bradford Krantz. Only almonds surpass these nuts when it comes to U.S. acres dedicated to production. Yet growers say many Americans are unable to identify them. A couple years ago, we went to a show up in New York for wholesale, and I'd say one out of every four people that came by said, oh, walnuts. And you say, well, no, not really, actually, it's pecan. Um, and so there's a lot of work to do domestically. However, enthusiasm outside the U.S., particularly in China, has grown rapidly in the past decade. While domestic consumption of the shelled version has remained relatively steady, increasing nearly 5% between 1997 and 2017, the export volume has grown 460% over the same period. That international interest and the resulting price surge have led to an expansion in pecan-growing regions of the United States. Georgia, the largest pecan-producing state, has seen roughly 5,000 acres added each year since 2011. 
the pecan prices uh, have uh, exploded, uh, and that in turn has led to a huge increase in uh, interest in pecans. Our acreage is growing rapidly. Pecan producers are optimistic about giving the domestic market a boost as they have, after several failed attempts, approved a federal marketing order allowing self-funded promotion of their product. The plan, launched in the aftermath of China implementing increased tariffs against the industry, includes the new marketing slogan, American Pecans, the original supernut. Those trying to recruit new fans don't care so much how consumers pronounce the name of the antioxidant-rich nut as long as they look beyond the Thanksgiving pie. The nut that we grow is a pecan, and some people say pecan, some people say pecan, and some people say pecan. And I am bound by my marriage vows to, to say pecan. My wife is, has really revolted at pecan, thinking that that's um, something that was put beside the bed in the olden days. USDA reports the nation had 392,700 acres of nut-bearing pecan trees as of 2017. University of Georgia Extension experts estimate that 40% of the nation's pecan acres are in the peach state. However, the data reveals it isn't peach production that has been trimmed back to make way for more pecans. Much of the land we see going into uh, pecan production is coming from row crop fields where they were growing cotton. We also see um, where people have been growing pine trees. Uh, we see a lot of that being cleared. Alex Wilson, a fourth generation grower working his family's Sunnyland Farms in Albany, says the increased interest from China was a game changer. As China began buying more U.S. pecans, the average U.S. price of all pecans grew from $1.12 per pound in 2007 to $2.59 a pound in 2016, an increase of 131 percent. My father likes to use a story that, and I forget the exact year, in 2006 or 2007 we had our best crop ever. And then four or five years later we made basically half as many pecans and sold them for overall more dollars. The Chinese really enjoy the hickory nut. The hickory nut uh, apparently had uh, some issues with, with quality and production uh, a few years ago. Pecan's actually a member of the hickory family. They used it that year, and, and since then the demand has stayed pretty heavy. The Chinese still prefer it in shell. They see it kind of as a, a communal, like let's crack some pecans and discuss. Um, but that's the older generation, you know, after going over to China a couple of different times, you know, you, you notice that the younger generation is actually more interested in a finished product. Farther north in Fort Valley, Georgia, another fourth generation producer, Al Pearson of Pearson Farm, watched as the area's market forces shifted when the Chinese began to buy directly from farmers who had previously sold to shellers the shellers were forced to compete with the Chinese buyers. What that did was open up a market for the farmer to supply the end user with the end shell pecans versus going to a sheller. So their entry into the market raised the price and the value of the, of the end shell pecan, tightened up the market for the domestic shelling operations. As all of this played out, others began to take note. New growers invested the $2,200 per acre to plant pecan trees, trees they knew would not produce a full crop for seven to nine years. A recent pecan producers meeting and pruning clinic in Wilcox County, Georgia, had nearly 60 attendees, where in past years there might have been a few dozen. We see a lot of new people getting in uh, to the pecan business right now. It may range anywhere from, uh, you know, people who are retiring and wanting to move back to their uh, farm, family farm, or uh, people who buy a little plot of land and want to try to grow something, um, all the way up to uh, large investment groups. Dixie Hudson, who grew up helping with her family's pecan orchards, had a small pecan grove of 17 trees, but she nearly doubled its size when prices climbed. 
my few trees that I have, pay my property taxes. I have a nice little Christmas and, uh, you know, I'm helping people get started. Maybe they'll make $2,000 next year on their pecans. Well, that was $2,000 more than they had last year. Hudson and other new growers, waiting anxiously for their new trees to begin producing, are betting on an increase in loyalty at home to counterbalance potential losses in Chinese market share. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Interesting to see an entire industry become so elastic. Certainly is, Mike, and the crops do go where the money is, it seems. They like. certainly do. Well, next week, an interesting feature on Canadian dairies. And speaking of money, we've been hearing much on the news lately about a steep Canadian tariff on American milk. Unlike dairies in other parts of the world, a Canadian producer's price is set and the supply managed to protect income. We're told there's a cost for that stability, but a trade group disputes the claim. How does the Canadian system work? Should we try it in the States? That's next time on Farm Week. And before we say goodbye, this is an ag-related show after all. You may have heard of the rally <laughs> banana being used by the Mississippi State baseball team for good luck in the College World Series. Dole Banana, which claims to be the title of the world's largest banana provider, has officially picked the Diamond Dogs to win it all this year. We wish them all the best and hope they go bananas in the rest of the series. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.